today's lecture. Um, today I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. Johnny Peter, and uh, really I should use uh, the title twice because he has both a medical degree and a PhD after that. And uh, he works at uh, UCT's Department of Immunology. So both of his undergrad and postgraduate studies were done here at UCT. And after that time, he spent two years abroad in uh, Oxford as a Nuffield Medical Fellow. He's now back here, um, spending his time on uh, genetic immunodeficiencies, severe drug and food additive allergies. So apart from trying to uh, grow and develop this discipline of allergology, I knew that was going to be a tongue twister, and clinical immunology, um, he also helps his wife raise their young family, and today he will talk to us about science, pseudoscience, and health. Thank you, Johnny. Thanks. Good, good morning, everyone. Uh, is everyone here at the back? Is that fine? Excellent. Good. Yeah, so, so it's uh, great to be here and to come and sort of give you some of my musings. Um, on, on this exciting field of uh, health science, really. Um, and in line with kind of current modern trends in health research, you always need to start whatever you do with conflicts of interest, okay? Because we've had some uh, bad stories of uh, scientists uh, getting undue kickbacks and things, uh, and this is now legislated that people must declare their conflict of interest. But I also think, uh, so to start with, you've heard from Vanessa, I'm a physician and academic, uh, and then really my list is quite short. Um, of uh, industry support, um, but really in the funding climate we have, it's almost impossible now for clinicians and for uh, health scientists not to have received some support. So an area of my PhD research was in urinary diagnostics for tuberculosis, um, and for that, uh, the company that developed it, it was a big diagnostic company, Alia, they uh, helped support that by donating uh, strips, the actual test, for use. And it's now been studied uh, in over like 3,500 patients. So that's a considerable import. But, but I think in line with um, what we'd heard today, in pre or not today, but in the previous two days' lectures, I think that perhaps in the scientific method and discussion, we could almost consider other biases that we all have when we approach science. Um, you know, maybe I'm more likely to consider the findings of a Harvard physician or an Oxford physician more favorably than I would in somebody from some other part of the US or, or another developing country, for instance, which may be biases uh, in the way that I conduct science. And in fact, I was thinking about this audience because I was thinking, well, you know, um, like, there are a lot of academics here, I see some doctors, I see some professors, uh, and I felt quite uh, intimidated coming to give this uh, lecture on my views on, on, on science and health to this audience. But then I thought to myself, well, actually, we've got all got a confirmatory bias in this room, and that by the fact that you came to this lecture, you are probably interested in science, and you probably have done scientific method yourself. So I felt to myself, well, actually, the real place I should be giving this lecture is perhaps in Nurtuk Community Valley uh, at the anti-vaccine group. Uh, that would be like a real challenge for me for this lecture. Um, but we'll kick off um, with... Uh, and, I, and I've, I've interspersed my talk, so I know that Jeff used Harry the wizard. Uh, I'm going to use another famous uh, physician who people considered to be quite a wizard in his time and also said some very in uh, insightful comments, and that is uh, William Osler, the great Canadian physician who headed up John Hopkins for a while. Um, and what he starts with, um, and I think this is always the starting point in science, and Jeff raised this, and that is observation. So most medical science starts with a good observation. And he says here, there's no more difficult art to acquire than the art of observation. And for some men, it is quite as difficult to record an observation in brief and plain language. And I think that's actually one of the challenges for us as scientists or academics is the real uh, teachers and the real skill is often taking our complex uh, academic musings and scientific thoughts and distilling them down into messages that people without training and without uh, experience in the field can understand and can relate to that. And that's a lot 
um, is essence of what uh, of science, health science is about. So I think it's worth kicking off, though, with a, a medical story. Um, and certainly, this is a story that's inextricably intertwined with our country uh, to date. Uh, and yet, also, it really illustrates very nicely the strength of modern uh, health science, the interplays between scientists and uh, politics, uh, activists, uh, and a whole host of current things that influence and intersect with the conduct of health science. So it starts with an observation. So in 1981 is the year, uh, and these two reports, small case series, okay, eight patients, uh, 11 patients. Okay, but what's the reason that they get reported as different from unusual and um, from, from the routine clinical practice of these doctors is that they are unusual. The first one talks about a form of a vascular cancer called Kaposi sarcoma, and they use words here that it has unusual features. It's more generalized, it's more aggressive, and it's found in a group of homosexual men in the New York area. Similarly, 11 cases of a type of rare pneumonia called pneumocystis. Now, the marker and the key alarm that this um, finding and this organism uh, caused was the fact that this organism doesn't cause pneumonia in people with competent immune systems. So it sounded the bell that there was a problem with some of the patient's cell-mediated immune function. Likewise, it was some patients that were found in the homosexual community, but also in IV drug users. And so you've probably all identified it by now. This story unfolds rapidly from them, and we're talking about the epidemic of HIV. So in June 1982, this was further uh, characterized. And by the end of the first year, 270 patients had been described. 121 were deceased, a mortality rate of close to 50%. And the CDC were immediately alerted, and cases started appearing across the world, Europe, Haiti, Uganda. In early 1983, the disease was reported to be found in uh, people that were heterosexual. The main thing, and you've seen this in the recent Ebola epidemic, which was highlighted, is the main thing for an epidemic is to quickly and rapidly identify how the disease is spread, okay, because that uh, alerts one and the health practitioners into the precautions you need to take and all those. So the CDC, um, which is the Center for Disease Control in the States, quickly identified that the major, what were the major routes of transmission of this uh, unknown, at that time, unknown pathogen, okay, and they ruled out transmission, uh, transmission by casual contact, food, water, air, and surfaces, which is in strong contrast to the precautions that were needed in Ebola. The science really kicked off from then, and I picked this um, small little editorial blurb from science because I feel it really um, highlights for me a number of good aspects of the scientific discourse and scientific process in health. So I'll, to start with here, it says, in the three years since AIDS um, was first identified, the cause of the disease has been intensely sought and often just as tensely, intensely debated. And I think that's the first thing you'll hear me say a number of times is that's talking among scientists, a group of scientists discussing things, debating whether they were wrong. That is the eth essence of the scientific method and certainly the good scientific method. And it lends itself to external validity, to a number of scientists validating the same findings. It says, most investigators expected an infectious agent, probably a virus would turn out to be the cause. But this was by no means a universal view. This issue of science contains four reports, and these are the early descriptions uh, from Robert Gallet's group, and there's a French group that almost simultaneously identified the retrovirus, uh, which we now call HIV, which originally was called HTLV, a human T cell lymphotropic virus, or LAV was the similar virus that they also identified and they were turned out to be the same virus. The identifying this causative agent had huge knock-on effects because they were able to develop diagnostic tests and they were able to start to identify the spectrum of the disease and so on in terms of therapy. But I think at this point, it's worth um, raising the issue of causality and association. Um, basically, Robert Koch, 
uh, another famous microbiologist that is inextricably linked with this country because he is actually famous for the discovery in 1890 of the tuberculous bacteria, another killer, uh, the biggest killers in, in, in South Africa at the moment. Um, and he published these postulates. And so from a microbiologist, and I see there's a microbiologist in the audience there, so I must make sure I get it correct here. But he, po he, he postulated these four simple postulates for proving that a microorganism, in this case he was thinking about bacteria predominantly, were associated with uh, and cause disease. And the key was that they must be present in all cases. The pathogen should be isolated from disease and then grown, okay? The pathogen from pure must be able to be inoculated into animals and cause disease. And then when you re-isolate the pathogen from an infected host, it should look the same as the original one. Now, clearly, there are some limitations of these postulates. And in fact, I'm going to talk to you a little bit in the next slide about AIDS denialism. And the AIDS denialists actually hopped onto these postulates as being evidence for why HIV virus didn't cause um, uh, um, AIDS. So I think that these are the original ideas and I wanted to introduce them because these now have subsequently been surpassed and updated with things like the Bradford Hill criteria into the molecular age, into the introduction of viruses. And essentially now this probably, this fifth postulate should say, if there's sufficient microbial data to allow scientists to treat, cure and prevent a particular disease, that should be evidence of the causal um, relationship of that particular organism. And of course, that makes sense. And it ties in again with um, what Jeff was saying about observation, theory, and prediction. Once you have that pathogen, you should be able to predict what happens. And that allows you, in the case of medicine, to be able to treat it effectively with particular agents, and importantly, to prevent. Now, treating, we're doing very well. Curing, we're not so sure about. And preventing, we still struggling when it comes to HIV. And I've mentioned this process of causal interfer inference because I think that in, if you look at pseudoscience, one of the big, and if you look at large epidemiology studies, one of the problems, and it's not just pseudoscience, but it's also a problem in medicine, medical science, is that people are too quick to draw um, what, is, what are associations into causality. And so that's an important distinction. And that's why I also put up these postulates, because to show how rigorous the science needs to be behind making something from what they think is associated with a particular condition to proving that it's actually the cause. It's a much more rigorous process. So of course, the story of HIV then unfolds rapidly with the developments of appropriate therapies, first with AZT. Uh, and there's an entire story. And some of you will have seen movies like Dallas Buyers Club, things that, that show the, the, the political context um, and, the, and, 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 and the sort of activist environment that was driving a lot and helping, I have to say, the, the scientific process to rapidly pro progress to treat treatments and finding new treatments that were effective. And I'll show you later in the talk um, the timelines for developing new drugs. And then you will be amazed at how rapidly the HIV drug environment actually developed in the context of modern uh, medicines today. But on the flip side, there was also the issue of denialism. And I think the AIDS denialism movement um, highlights a lot of the um, issues around the sort of pseudoscience and alternative practices. And that's why I've picked it as an example. So to start with, uh, basically the tenets of HIV denialism was that they either reject altogether the presence of this virus, or they accept that HIV exists, but regard it as a harmless passenger virus that's not causative of, of AIDS. And we've just been through some of those tenets by which we've tried to prove the causal link. Now what's interesting, is the science of these groups tends to be driven by one or two maverick scientists. So, and that should always raise, and I'll show you later, I've got a little toolbox for people, but to me, the, the lone expert should always raise alarm bells, okay? And uh, people will remember Prof, Prof Dosenberg, he drove a lot of the uh, AIDS denialism. What's interesting is they always tend to evoke um, distrust in big science, in pharma, uh, corporate vested interests. They then ho hone in particularly 
on toxicities. And this is common in, say, in the anti-vaccine movement, right? There's a unreal, uh, uh, sort of uh, an inappropriate focus on the toxicities and costs of drugs. And then what's interesting about, about most of these denialist movement and even the anti-vaccine movement is they really do look for scientific credibility. So actually what they do is they try to uh, sort of cherry pick um, various scientific statements or arguments to support their particular theories. And it's interesting because I read an interesting uh, editorial in Nature Medicine where they, as, an, as a journal, were trying to distance themselves from a, a group that had used this particular statement saying that you know, the reason why HIV infection is pathogenic is still to be debated. This is in 2003. The group of AIDS denialist scientists had used that statement as evidence that the scientific community, in fact, didn't really uh, believe that HIV caused AIDS. So again, this sort of uh, kind of bridge between uh, trying to get scientific credibility and to use uh, scientific principles. Then, of course, the next uh, sort of saga related to HIV was the use of African uh, herbal remedies, okay? Now, this um, area is, again, it's sort of, it's, it's in line with homeopathy and the science associated with homeopathy. But what's interesting about this, and it's worth exploring, so you'll all, when I'm talking about these, you'll, you'll, you'll be familiar with the African potato, okay? I, hypoxis, okay? That's one therapy. Garlic is another therapy, and Sutherlandia is another plant. Now, in fact, these um, were picked up by previous ministers of health, okay, uh, and they were actually advocated in public as being useful therapies. And if you look at the science, if you take a scientific method to these therapies, what you'll see, and this is a feature in a lot of alternative uh, medical therapies applied to any number of medical conditions, so the principles are the same, is that often the data supporting them are from either in vitro studies, so either somebody has taken some cells and looked at what happens to immune cells when exposed to concentrations, and often the concentrations are way above anything that you reproduce physiologically. And then the other thing is that they often in adult animal studies, so they've shown and some immune boosting in, and for instance, African potato has got that data. It uh, was shown to be safe in a primate model, and it was also shown to be uh, of some immune benefit in an animal mouse model, right? But often, the key thing is that the evidence in human trials is lacking, and subsequently, the medical community has gone on to, to, to this. But the, 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 the real issue is it's, it would be fine if you know people wanted to take African potato on their own accord and nothing would potentially come of it. However, in this country, that is not what happened. The impacts of people and political support and the movement behind supporting these things has both a health impact um, and obviously uh, it, it slowed people getting onto antiretrovirals, it stopped them from getting onto antiretrovirals, and there's a body of science which has subsequently shown to not be a really big issue, but that these substances were interfering with the activity of antiretroviral drugs and enhancing the toxicity of them by altering the met metabolic enzymes such as p-glycoprotein or the cytochrome system that actually they were they were almost you know they were detrimental to patients what's interesting is in the recent uh, couple of years there's now quite good studies longitudinally on cohorts of patients taking antiretrovirals and using traditional uh, African medicines and it seems about 10 percent of people that take antiretrovirals still use some form of traditional uh, medicines. And what's interesting about them is they're now the data to show that it doesn't change their CD4 counts, the viral load. So the science has shown they don't really make a difference for patients. But what's interesting is there seems to be this interesting inverse correlation. So as people become more established on antiretrovirals, so they've been on antiretrovirals for longer, the use of traditional African remedies goes down. Okay, And similarly, there's a correlation between people's severity of symptoms, so how much pain, how much nausea, how much other symptomatology they're getting, and their use of these traditional medicines. And I think you see that because the other area is cancer, 
where a lot of alternative medicines are used. And often there is a correlation between the symptomatology um, that patients are experiencing and they need and their desperation to try other things. But the interesting thing is with HIV is that as people become treated and start to respond to the actual drugs, their need and use of these things has now been shown to, to decrease. So I think that the, um, you know, that enticing kind of medical story really cross covers the gambit of what I'm going to talk about today. So that's why I wanted to kick off with that story. So I think that the important uh, part I'm going to try to do in the remainder now is to show some of the complexities of conducting modern science. Uh, some of them are general, some of them are specific. Um, and I like this quote as a starting point, which is that no human being is constituted to know the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And even the best of men must be content with fragments, with partial glimp glimpses, never the, never the full fruition. And I think that's really true of medical science. And why? Because the human is a complex universe. Okay? I put a baby here because we all think about babies as kind of simple not being able to do much, okay, and they can't. But at a cellular level, they are quite miraculous, okay? If you think we have 50 to 100 trillion cells, these are the numbers we're dealing with. Three billion base pairs in the human genome, okay? We've talked briefly about uh, genomics in, uh, previously. Less than 2% of the genome is actually protein coding DNA, what we call the exome, okay? Of that, there seems to be about 20 to 40,000 functional loci, okay? And what's interesting about these functional loci in humans, and we mentioned this, Anisha mentioned this, we're talking about our, our closeness to chimpanzees, is what's interesting is those number of functional locusts are similar for proteins to things like roundworm, okay? Anisha mentioned banana, okay? But they're actually remarkably uh, similar, but what makes essentially, and, we, and we're starting to unpack this, what makes humans different is all the stuff that comes after that. Our ability to splice the DNA up into various combinations to make different functioning proteins, okay? And then all this area of what we call non-coding DNA. And we're only now beginning to understand that, and this is a field which we call epigenetics. It's basically how the genetic code can be altered and impacted on environment. It determines which particular genes we, co we, we, we transcribe and produce proteins from at various times. And it's this huge world of incredible complexity and we're just kind of unpacking. But this is really uh, where sort of molecular science is at now. Uh, and it's given rise to whole new fields such as system biology where we try to to understand the interactions between this. But it's not that simple. So the next thing is that from the time you conceived onwards, you as humans are interacting with the environment. And of course, I'm an immunologist, so I've got a leaning towards the immune system as obviously being the best part of the human body and the most amazing part because it's the part that's constantly interacting and sampling your environment and at the same time distinguishing what is you from what is bad and what needs to have alarm sound. Now, this eloquent study that's recently published in Cell by a Stanford group, these two graphs illustrate a key thing about how the environment changes you and how you respond. And that indicates that the science goes far beyond genetics. So just to highlight this, what this is, is it's twin studies where they've looked at, and they look at over 240 different immune parameters. But these I've just put up as the cell frequencies, the simple that some of you may be familiar with. But basically they look at the correlation amongst young monozygotic twins with the same genetics. So this is age, these, these twins were aged in their 20s, and looked at old monozygotic twin correlations in their 60s. Okay, well 60 to 95. So a wide range, but that was the, the, the criteria. And essentially here, you can see this is the correlation. This is one, so that's excellent correlation, okay? And you can see that with a number of cells, when you're young, or most cells, they predict your, your genetics, predict your cell counts and your cell numbers. But as you age, when you're, when you're older, look at all these cells here that now correlate very poorly. So two identical genomes, yet their numbers and frequencies of something simple like the immune system, immune cells, 
is actually totally distinct in the age. So this indicates in the role of non-hereditable factors. This, they give one example in the paper, relates possibly to things like chronic viral infections that we're exposed to, such as cytomegalovirus. And so you'll see here that these are, are people that remain negative, and they tend to have better correlations than people that are discordant. So something like that could be driving uh, the problem. So then, of course, that's the complexity. But then, of course, humans are not something that in other many aspects of animal science or anything, you can just go and do whatever you like to. Okay? And some of you may recognize this. This is Carl, Dr. Carl Brunt, who was the German medical officer that was sentenced to death in the Nuremberg trials for all of his medical experimentation during the time of the, world, of the Second World War. Interestingly, some of that scientific data, particularly as it pertains to physiology, is still used and is what we rely on today, the extremes that the human systems were put through to. That human physiological data actually still forms the basis of a number of, 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 of our current teachings uh, in human physiology. But needless to say, and I think obviously it was a very good thing, that we decided, well, you, there's a point to what you can do to people, right, ethically, and that's as it should be. And it started with this Nuremberg Code, and subsequently now there's a number of sort of ethical treaties that govern the ethics uh, of human uh, clinical research. But as, a, as, as can be imagined, that's got limitations in terms of how you can design studies, how you can conduct human clinical trials, in terms of testing your hypotheses. Okay, so it's a factor that we have to consider that other a lot of other scientists don't. And consequently, we use a lot of animal models, and these have their own problems. Okay, because animal physiology might be totally different. And we might discover something in an animal only to find out later in a clinical trial that it has no relevance. Then this is something that epidemiologists um, are aware of, and that is the fact that there's huge numbers of things we're exposed to, and something can have a small effect on the human body that might take 20, 30 years to accumulate, a long lag time before manifesting with any disease. And the field of carcinogenesis, or carcinogens, is a huge field which is, has this problem. How, what exposures are we exposed to through our life okay, that land up causing problems? And I put here this, these set of adverts. You can Google them. There are hundreds of different ads, which basically showed that for a long time, doctors, we thought smoking was advocated. It was a good idea. Okay? And then the, 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 the famous epidemiologist Richard Dole started to demonstrate uh, that, in fact, cancer was, uh, and smoking was the biggest predictor of lung cancer. Um, and what's impli the implications for these epidemi epidemiology studies is the size of studies and cohorts that you need to follow in order to draw some of these associations with robust statistics. So for instance, in, in, in 1950, Richard Dole found the association looking at 20 London hospitals between smoking and lung cancer. But it wasn't until four years later that the British doctors study, which had about 40,000 doctors uh, and followed them for 20 years, actually confirmed that association. There subsequently still needed to be a bunch of research um, in vitro and in clinical that actually proved the causality from the association. But that's another problem that we face. And perhaps that's a uh, general problem. Okay? Now, as that sort of raises some general issues that possibly other fields of, uni of particle physics or, or paleobiology have, have in common. It's complex. We all know that. Okay? But what's interesting is, are there some specific things that are unique to health science? And I think the key here is the patient. Okay? The individual is at the epicenter of health science and is the consumer of health science. Okay, and I'll, at this point I'll digress for a little moment because I'll recommend to you, if you're interested in this field, to go and read a book by this author here, and I've put up so you can remember. I'm happy for you to, to, to take pictures of the slide or I can give you this link, uh, the reference afterwards. It's a book actually written in 1999 by an historian journalist, and it's called The Rise and Fall of Modern Medicine. And here he talks about 
One of the paradoxes, his book is, is really a discussion of four paradoxes. And the paradox he's talking about and referring to in the above quote is the fact that in most developed countries today, life expectancy is better than it's ever been. Okay, we live now into our 70s, 80s, even older. Infant mortality rates are lower than they've ever been. Essentially, people are healthier than we've ever been. Yet, more people are worried about their health. Okay, one in three uh, people use uh, alternative healers. Um, and, and for instance, he gives an interesting uh, statistic. I'm just going to find it here. Uh, I can't remember the exact, it's, it's, I can't access my notes, but essentially to the effect that in, in the year he quotes, about 320 million people visited primary care physicians in the US, about 425 million people visited alternative medical practitioners. So despite the fact that we, we have got these huge advances in modern med medicine, we still are worried and looking for other answers. In addition, he looked at doctors, and this is the other paradox. He looked at the fact that doctors, more doctors now, up to 50%, and this was in 2000, I'm not sure what the figure is updated, were disillusioned with being in the practice of medicine compared to in the 1960s, which was about 10%. So I think that this illustrates that um, you know, the individual, the, the human element of health science is, is driving some of the, the, the political sentiment or the individual sentiment. So with those challenges, though, I want to highlight a couple of the methodological uh, aspects. As I'm just checking in the time here. Yeah, fine. So I want to highlight to you a couple of the ways in which modern scientific methods in medicine are trying to address some of these issues. So the first thing is, in addition to individual case series, and we still look out for the epidemic disease that comes in a small case series, those are still published and are looked out to by uh, individual clinicians. But what we've really moved to is these large multi-center observational cohort studies or large multi-center randomized controlled trials, which try to look for small effect sizes, okay, and small associations. But they often span across, across many countries. They, um, as you can imagine, they cost a fortune to run, okay. Uh, and then together with this, from the molecular level, we're now trying, uh, with our bioinformatic approaches, to test system biologies, the interactions between complex genetics, uh, epigenetic, uh, and environmental factors to try and see whether we can tease out the mechanistic understanding of diseases. What we've also done is now there are like 30,000 publications a month that enter the medical literature. No doctor can keep up with that. Okay, so what we have to rely on is data synthesis. Okay, so people that focus on synthesizing available medical evidence. Okay, uh, and, and 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 to see and their particular statistical methods that now govern rules around meta-analysis, systematic review. We've tried to make move away from the expert opinion. Okay, and what we've done is most guidance developing or policy developing medical communities now have a grading system that's fairly rigorous and fairly strict for grading the quality of evidence, okay? An expert opinion, the thing that used to uh, define medical practice in the early uh, um, 20th century has now is downgraded to a D, okay, which is the lowest form of evidence. And the highest form of evidence is these large multi-center randomized control trials, okay? Then additionally, we now now, in, especially in drug research and pharma, we use operational and post-marketing research. So once a drug comes to market, there's still a huge amount of surveillance and things that goes in to ensuring that small effects uh, and small side effects are not that, that weren't detected in the early clinical trial process. Together with that sort of scientific approach has come an increase in the regulatory environment. Now, I started with my conflict of interest uh, statement. Now, in the States, the American Medical Association passed something called the Sunshine Act, okay? And essentially what this said is that doctors need to declare upfront in any research that they do, any industry involvement, money they received, a huge long list of things they must declare in order to show and demonstrate where they could be potentially conflicted. Similarly, it's got regulations on the industry in what they can offer doctors and how they can incentivize doctors in practice. 
Obviously, patient ethics, we've talked about that, and then astringent uh, regulatory bodies for the FDA. But what's encouraging, too, is there's a move to open access for scientific literature. Now, this is both good and bad, but it means that as a lay public, you can easily access uh, a lot of high-quality scientific research. But now that, that rigor comes with some impacts. And this, I put up this uh, slide because I think it highlights a number of things with regard to say you have a new drug that you need to develop. Now, it starts off, before this, is the gap of research and development. You've got to find it, you've got to screen for it, you've got to do all the things that you need to to actually get a candidate molecule that might be effective in a particular disease. But once you have that, you then have to do preclinical testing in laboratory animal, animals, that's two years, another phase one study in healthy animals, phase two studies in healthy volunteers, four, five years, and then more studies in large phase three efficacy trials that can be up to six years. And so the average time to develop a new drug is probably 10 to 15 years before a molecule that's in somewhere in a laboratory that looks promising for cancer actually comes to the market to be used on patients. Now, that obviously has major advantages, but it certainly takes a lot of time, okay? The important thing to note as well, just from the point of view of, of the public, is that even though it takes 10 to 15 years to get a new drug to market, by the time it comes to market, it's probably only seen 6,000 people in this whole evaluation. So actually, small effects, small side effects, really might only come available when you've seen it exposed to 500,000 people. So it's another important thing, that even though it's a big, time-consuming uh, process, you still actually haven't put it into that many people. Okay, And obviously, this costs millions and millions of dollars. And the, the impact of that, and there was a recent editorial about it in Nature, was the fact that it's driving research into the hands of fewer and fewer academics. It means that, and this is a potential area of conflict, is that you know, to, if you want to conduct a diabetes clinical trial, maybe only a certain institute at Harvard with their huge academics, one or two leading scientists, they're the only people with the resource and funding and academic clouts and international clouts to actually pull off a study. And it tends to move, unfortunately, move funding away from investigator-led individual hypothesis-driven work. So that's one impact on this rigorous scientific method. The other is, of course, this, publication bias. Okay, And basically, it's been shown now in a number of places that statistically positive results are three times more likely to be published than negative findings. Okay, Big industries and pharmacies, if they have a negative trial on something, they can just choose not to publish it. Okay, And then and this very eloquent uh, study that's now been very highly cited by a, a, a statistics and epidemiology professor at um, Stanford that some of you may know is basically just a very eloquent statistical um, uh, uh, sort of discussion and with some examples of why a lot of published data is in fact false. And it uses simple statistics that Jeff introduced, you, uh, introduced to you about pre-test odds and pre-odds of, of an actual real effect. And then the classic statistical powers uh, calculations that we all do when we conduct our sample sizes. We look at a, an alpha type 1 error, the chance of rejecting your hypothesis. Um, and he uses the simple statistics to show how when you've got this huge number of studies, how a lot of them will be wrong. And this stresses the need for science to be replicated. And it's a key component to a good scientific method. What strategies have we got, though, to combat this? Well, we've got these clinical trial registries. So now, a priori, a pharmacy or industry needs to register their study okay, before they can um, start it and before it can ever get published. And there are people that now manage these registries and says after five years, hey, you started, um, Merck, you started the study of this new vaccine. Where's the data? Why haven't you, you know, it's been recruiting, why haven't you published? So it's some way of forcing pharma to, to come to the, to, to the table with, with negative results. Then also there are a number of statistical methods when you look at pooling data on how to detect whether there's a significant publication bias, these things called funnel plots and some of the statistics that's even above me. And then, of course, I particularly like this, and this is because if you've ever signed a, a scientist that's submitted your paper to a journal and suffered the months of waiting to get a final rejection, well, you can always submit to this journal. This is the journal of universal rejection. <laughs> 
The advantages of this journal is that you can submit your manuscript without suffering your anxieties about the eventual fate. It's 100% certain that you won't be accepted. There are no fees. And you can claim to have submitted to the most prestigious journal judged by acceptance of articles. <laughs> you can retain complete rights. In fact, you're free to submit to other journals even before the review process is complete. And decisions are often, though not always, rendered within a few hours of submission. <laughs> so that's the other drive to get negative results out there. So then all great uh, physicians and, and Osler was no, no different and in your day-to-day -day medical practice, what you're aware of is the variability of life, of, of individual life, and the fact that very infrequently do two patients behave in the same way, despite the scientific papers or probabilities that you've read. And the element of, of faith uh, and, and patient belief uh, is something that has been recognized for a long time. And Osler sums it up here and says, nothing in life is more wonderful than faith. The one great moving force which we can neither weigh in the balance nor test in the crucible, intangible as the ether, electable as gravitation, the radium of the moral and mental spheres, mysterious, indefinable, known only by its effect, Faith pours out an unfailing stream of energy while abating nor jot nor title of its potency. Now, we've done a little bit better than Osler in talking about this, and what we're referring to is the placebo effect. Okay? And this moves us from the scientific method, probably I think quite neatly, into the realm of pseudoscience within health. Largely, this is being recognized as the effect of what we call the placebo effect. And what this is, is this is the effect that if a patient believes that a therapy is effective, then it actually can be effective. This placebo effect now is not just something that's totally mysterious, okay? It's actually quantifiable, okay? And I think these studies, there's some very eloquent studies to show this. For instance, this fake surgical study in 2002, they took 60 patients with knee osteoarthritis that were crippled with their knees, okay? They had an elaborate ruse with videos of the surgery, everything related to it, but in one group, they took out the knee, in the other, they just cut the skin and closed it up, okay? Lo and behold, even out to one year, the symptoms and improvement were the same, okay? Which is quite remarkable, okay? And certainly what we're discovering as we look into placebo effects is that certain symptoms are more susceptible to the effects of placebo. Pain is one particular one uh, that, is, that is quite uh, amenable, and that's the one referred to in this uh, surgery study. And the remarkable thing is you could say, well, if I don't believe in placebo, then it won't work. That defeats the whole various thing. But actually, that's not true. So a study in patients with uh, inflammatory bowel syndrome in 2010 and showed that even when you told people that I'm going to give you an inert pill that doesn't work, there were patients, a certain percentage, and normally placebo effects thought to be somewhere between 30 and 40 percent, depending on what you're dealing with, will actually get better. And there's now even editorials in the scientific literature about the fact that this placebo effect may be ruining new drugs, okay? Because the selection of patients that um, come into clinical trials, so not every patient wants to be part of a clinical trial, but there's some suggestion that there's a neurocognitive basis to the placebo effect, and that people that enter or agree to be part of clinical trials have the neurocognition which is more susceptible to placebo effect. So that actually, the placebo effect in clinical trials may be an overestimation of what the placebo effect like is actually in the general population. So that adds just even another uh, sort of complexity. And then there are even some lovely studies, uh, and there's a, even um, the philosopher Alain Dupouton has written a book called The Architecture of Happiness. Uh, and this basically has been shown that even having a pleasant view, so if your office looks onto a brick building, then it's not as nice as if your office looks onto a nice open field with good air coming in, and actually that all could actually make you healthier and feel better. So there's actually some now data to even support that. So I thought that we'd move from the esoteric and the sort of philosophies, and hopefully you've got some 
introduction to in the final few slides I wanted to give you an example of the question that as health consumers you might work through or actually have and this you could relate to should I take a new drug for this experimental drug for my prostate cancer should I take anything but the question that uh, you know I face now with young children is my wife keeps asking me should we vaccinate our daughter with this vaccine should we do this and uh, so the particular one I thought to give an example not to go through the you know, 50,000 publications of measles vaccine and the debates about that, which would maybe tire everyone and you all know, I thought I'd go through a new vaccine that's come on the market. So this is Jardisil, okay, and what is Jardisil? So this is a vaccine that targets, uh, that protects against the human papilloma virus, and this virus is, and these particular serotypes of the virus cause cervical cancer. There are about 70% of cases that uh, cause cervical cancer. And um, then also there's these, so that's 16 and 18, 6 and 11 tend to cause genital warts, okay? So this vaccine is aimed against young, or aimed at young women, uh, or young girls, more should I be, say, between sort of 9 and 15. And the, currently that's the FDA recommendation. But now that's a public health message, okay? But what about your daughter, right here, right now, or your granddaughter, what should you, what what should you advise to them? And of course, I'm just saying that this has now been approved in 100. So this is an available vaccine. The scientific community has said that it's safe to use. So let's do the numbers because I think this is the key place to start. So your risk of developing cervical cancer from what we call high-grade squamous epithelial. So that's what uh, a neoplasia, and that's basically a precancerous lesion. So this is what you look for when you do a pap smear. You do a pap smear and you detect this on the cervix and then you make treatment decisions uh, based on this. So your risk is about 7% to go on to develop cervical cancer. With pap smears, regularly early detection, treatment, the risk could even be lower than that. Okay, good screening programs and procedures such as LETS, some surgical procedures can even reduce that further. So this is the main efficacy phase three trial of Jardisil, which is called the Future 2 trials published in the NEJM. Okay, it was stopped early by the Data Safety Ring Monitoring Board because of the effect scene okay that's normally what happens is it stops because there's so much benefit that they say that the, it's at, it's now an ethically uh, it's unethical to keep a placebo on okay but what were the actual numbers and the actual prevalences so the prevalence of this high-grade uh, precancerous lesion was 0.7 in the study population the vaccine efficacy to uh, to protect against particular strains protected by the vaccine was 98 percent the vaccine efficacy to prevent that was 22%, that's all the H HPV strains. Remember, there's only targets two, okay? So cancers can be caused by a numbers, okay? And the serious adverse events seem to be similar. There are about 0.1% in both the placebo and the vaccine group. So the absolute, if you do the numbers, the absolute risk reduction from the vaccine is about 0.01%, one in 100, right? And it reducing your, your risk of about 5% from getting cancer to about 4%, okay? Not that impressive, okay? But it's all about the context, okay? And if you manipulate numbers very slightly, suddenly things look very different. So, for instance, if you live in some parts of sub-Saharan Africa where the HIV sera prevalence is 15 to 20%, then your risk of going from high-grade cancer to malignancy with cervical cancer could be 60%, okay? Plus, these... Um, these, these safety nets, pap smears, cancer screening, non-existent in many parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. No regular pap smears available. Now suddenly that risk starts to look uh, substantial. Now, here, the prevalence of HISIL, again, huge HIV population, much higher uh, prevalence, background prevalence of these abnormal lesions and HPV, because uh, it's also a sexually transmitted disease, so much higher uh, background prevalences of disease. Now suddenly these same vaccine figures, well, you can drop your risk now by 0.7%, right? That's a factor of 70 different, okay? So depending on your context, depending on where you are, this, these numbers really change and can, it's the same vaccine doing the same job. So I think given that, the post-marketing surveillance data becomes important because ultimately whether or not to have the vaccine becomes a risk-benefit discussion, okay? And here, 
you see one, one year post-approval review, 35 million doses given, 600,000 patients actively monitored. This data I took from the one year uh, FDA regulatory process review slides. It's openly available on the internet. Okay, 12,000 non-severe reactions. And basically what they do in these committees is they look at the background risk of these conditions. How many people develop Guillain-Barre syndrome? How many people have a stroke? How many people die? And they look to see whether the people getting vaccinated or in close proximity to the vaccine are occurring, these diseases and these problems are occurring at a higher frequency. And that would sound, uh, sound the alarm bell. So really what they concluded is that there was slightly uh, 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 increased relative risk. This is about, uh, this is a twofold relative risk uh, increase in, this is venous thromboembolism, okay? So that might be something to consider, but they didn't find uh, a significant uh, problem. So based on that, you might, and the numbers, you might uh, think about whether or not it actually warrants the cost of the vaccine, which is currently about 2,000 to 3,000 rand, whether it actually costs uh, and, it, and it's beneficial for you to uh, give your granddaughter. And also the decision might be different if you are policy maker for sub-Saharan Africa. You might make a very different policy recommendation, but something to consider. Then, what about this? Okay, well then enter the media into vaccines. Right, so the first thing which, which uh, I haven't been able to show, and you can go and have a look at this, is after I've shown you the numbers, YouTube that particular reference. What you find is a young girl in her 20s who had Guillain-Barre syndrome. And she spends five minutes, and it's now had 500,000 hits, okay? She spends five minutes talking about how her life has been ruined, her dreams have been ruined, all by that infection and that she's going to, and she's currently suing Merck, the mac, va vaccine manufacturers, for that problem. But now, if you recall the safety data, and if you look, go back to the numbers, the risk of Guillain-Barre in a general population is a certain amount. So it's very tricky to try to put causality at the vaccine in terms of her symptoms. But I have to say, my wife watched it, and that's what prompted this whole uh, series, is that she was pretty moved by that. And she said to me, whoa, what, what about this, right? Then subsequently as well, recently in the media, and this is, you can see this is in 2009, after the vaccine was released in 2006, one of the researchers, her name was uh, Diane Harper, she came out in an in a, in a AIDS international conference meeting saying that she is essentially um, not sure about the risk benefit of HPV vaccine for American girls, okay? Um, and essentially the anti-vaccine community this is all over the internet, right? And you can see here, lead vaccine developer comes clean. Okay, think about the languaging of this, comes clean. Jardisil and Svarix don't work, are dangerous, and weren't tested, okay? So this is again, remember how I mentioned with the AIDS denialism, cherry picking from the science. And if you actually read, Diane Harp is a very well published researcher. If you actually read her scientific papers, what she says is look at those numbers. That's all she's trying to say. And she gives the numbers and makes advice and says, well, actually, on a public health level, we need to consider all these risks, all the costs, okay, and the actual efficacy in different prevalence populations. And so actually, what she's saying is scientifically very sound, okay, but those two things, you can imagine if that is how it's disseminated rapidly on the internet can lead to a huge, and there is a huge anti-vaccine movement against this particular vaccine. So again, what it boils down to, right, and this is the, the situation that every day as physicians we face, is weighing the risk and benefit of a particular treatment, a particular investigation with an individual patient. And I think that discussion of this is, is key. And so to end with, I'll put these little toolkit that I could, could think about and that's how I approach these many articles. My wife showed me another article um, about cot death and about this particular fabric you use to wrap the mattresses in to prevent cot death. Okay, she brought this thing to me and was like, whoa, what's this? Should we be getting this for my daughter? Potentially a risk of thing. But if you do the numbers, you in, look into it, you can start to unpick the scientific integrity of this. And how do you do that? Well, I think the starting point is beware of your vulnerable areas, right? Health and health science touches all of us at some point. We'll all get sick. We all have to make these decisions, okay? Not as public health 
guideline developers, but as individual patients, we have to make this thing. So beware of your vulnerable things. When you have cancer, okay, and medical science says, we can't offer you any more than this. Beware of those times and those vulnerabilities and desperate measures, okay, because those are where you are susceptible to uh, these kinds of, of, of non-scientific or scientifically uh, potentially fraudulent areas. Then, do the numbers, okay? That's what we did for the vaccine. It helps to really lay out your thoughts. And use absolute, not relative numbers, right? I could have done that um, discussion with relative numbers, and the numbers would have looked a lot more impressive, okay, to you. But use absolute numbers. Then, like I said, distinguish where you're making those decisions. Are you the individual patient in South Africa, particular time and place, making a decision about receiving a treatment? Or are you making a guideline document for a, a, a public health intervention. Often the recommendations might be different. Then, beware of the lone expert, okay, or charismatic maverick scientist, right? We have a couple of them around in the community at the moment in South Africa, right? But again, it's, 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 it's just that's just that's just wisdom in the scientific method. It doesn't necessarily mean they're wrong, but in com scientific communities, the way that we debate and discuss our findings and try to reproduce them is a key component to the scientific method. And so all scientists need to be able to be open to that. And likewise, there are now many available sources of evidence synthesis. The Cochrane database review, they are rigorous. I've just finished doing a Cochrane review. It's tired me. It's put gray hairs onto me, right? And they basically are rigorous methods of synthesizing data. Often, when you want to make a decision, a guideline de de development group has already done this. And so it's useful to go there. And so then go to the original source where possible, OK? Decide your thresholds, because ultimately, that's what it boils down to, your risk versus your benefit of a particular therapy. And then for us as doctors, remember to first do no harm. I was in a meeting and somebody said to me, well, can I use a vitamin for immune boosting? Is that a good idea in my patients? Well, I said to them, well, it depends. It depends. I said, there's no evidence to support the use of most vitamins as immune boosting supplements. However, there is data to support that some of them will not do any harm, in which case, well, if it makes you feel better and maybe enhance your placebo effect, well, fantastic. There may be some clinical benefit. And I'll end with this quote from a, a, a neurosurgeon who recently died of lung cancer at the age of 36. And what he summarized here is that despite all the scientific method, despite um, you know, really knowing the ins and outs of statistical science and having been involved in patients his whole life, when it actually came to him facing his mortality, he, he, he had this to say, which was the end, which says, what patients seek is not scientific knowledge doctors hide, but existential authenticity each must find on her own. Getting too deep, getting too deep into statistics is like trying to quench a thirst with salty water. The angst of facing mortality has no remedy in probability. Thank you. How do I do that now? <laughs> uh, last viewed. There we go. I just I, I, before the lecture, I signed something saying this would be on the it could be videoed and was being videoed and be online. So, are we going to make that available yes, so people can see these things again? Okay, great. Um, I was very interested in your criticism as I've been of the epidemiological studies. I come from the environmental side of things, where we have great difficulties with the epidemiologists. And a particular case right now, for instance, this is in public mind, is the case of Audi and Volkswagen in America, where very few people realize that 60% of the knocks in America come from lightning. About 30% comes from aeroplanes. Uh, sorry, from agriculture. Uh, most of the rest comes from aeroplanes. 2% comes from ordinary light vehicles, of which Volkswagen makes up about 5%. So in other words, 0.1% of the total box problem in America came from the Volkswagens. And yet, because of the political and the economic side of things, that was the, not seen as the major problem. And it's the political side of, of, of pollution and environmental things that is of concern to me, because 
it's so easy for a politician to say, let's just be lower the limits and we will therefore protect people better. And this is an absolute disaster economically in many areas. So I just appreciate your comments on that sort of observation. Yeah, so, so I, was, I guess that, that uh, I think that where the, I, I personally think that obviously, um, I mean, and you'd be, it'd be crazy to say that the, the study of epidemiology hasn't given a huge amount to our scientific understanding and medicine in particular. But I think that what, I, what you've detected in me is actually something that was coming through from that author of the book that I, that, I, that I mentioned, The Rise and Fall of Modern Medicine. Because he, in a way, was quite critical of, and I think it's probably, he didn't distill this, but it's probably a combination of the criticism of sort of these huge epidemiology studies throwing out sort of associations of aluminium and Alzheimer's and whatever. And, 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 and then also the political, as you say correctly, and Ian's going to talk about the media tomorrow but the political sort of like grabbing hold of various bits of, of the scientific uh, discord that he puts as one of the factors that's contributed to this worried well the fact that even though we're living longer and are actually healthier we are cons completely consumed um, with with our with being unwell and, and what to do and now you know think about all the realms that it enters diet what should i eat how should i eat it should i have low carbs high fat should i have uh, you know it goes on right and he argues that a lot of that is driven by epidemiology association studies that haven't taken the next steps through to sort of definite cause and obviously i've mentioned some of the main problems with proving cause in some of these things it's almost impossible I'd like to go back to your phase of research, uh, one, two, three. We have, in the last five years, had two disasters in phase one. It's the German company, and now recently this Portuguese French disaster, where, in fact, one patient died. Why is this going to start questioning the validity of what we observe in animals and what we now start to observe in human beings? And what will be the consequences? Yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, there's another one uh, from an immu immunology point of view that was the uh, CD28 molecule in the UK where six people died of the healthy volunteers. And it called into question everything of phase one studies. And I think, though, I mean, we're in a rock and a hard place there because we only have animals to trial these things in. Um, and and in, in that particular molecule, I don't know the two that you're referring to now, but those ones, the animal study data safety was excellent. <laughs> and it was just the complete opposite effect in humans. And I, 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 the, the, the truth is, I, I don't think uh, we can get around that. I mean, we need to study and I, I think that the structure of phase one, we could maybe have smaller, we could maybe change the phasing of it, um, but I think potentially it has bad ramifications, those kinds of disasters. They're very bad for uh, sort of fast tracking or, or getting new mo molecules into practice because I don't really see a way around it, to be honest. So I think we need them. You have to have those studies. And maybe it's, again, a case of looking at the absolute numbers because you look at all healthy volunteers given all different new investigational products, well, we're only having a very, very tiny amount. So actually, if you look at an absolute risk, the, the risk of a healthy volunteer having a negative effect in a trial, and hence the robustness of animal models, is probably within an acceptable amount. And I think, you know, like all these things, it can blow up in the politics, uh, and that can be detrimental. But actually, probably, if you look at the numbers, we're still on the right track. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's my thoughts. <laughs> The solution that would be uh, involved in examining a genetic makeup um, they're definitely doing that. I mean, they do that even at the animal level. I mean, they try to look at particular uh, genomic uh, responsiveness. Um, and certainly, pharmacogenomics is moving that way, yeah. So, so I do think that might help. Uh, you know, everybody's gene genetic makeup isn't exactly. Yeah, yeah. The difficulty, though, is when you've got a totally new molecule, um, well, how do you know which gene is important or not? So it's not that easy. It's, it's like you almost know that on most, if you look at those genetic pharmacogenomic studies, they're mostly done at the end. So you put a drug into phase two or phase three, and at the end of it, 
you realize, oh, the drug didn't work in everyone, but hey, there was a small group of people that it did work. Let's look at their SNPs. And you go and look at their SNPs and you find a group that works. But that's learning. Yeah, exactly. But I'm saying it doesn't really, uh, in, in hopefully. There were, there were two books by, um, I can't remember his name, I think it's Ben Goldberg, called Bad, 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 Bad Science. Science and Bad Pharma. Yeah. And he was pretty critical across a very broad spectrum of medicine to pharmaceutical, the quality of pharmaceutical research and the kind of studies you're talking about. Are, is that book um, uh, just a maverick or, or are his criticisms across that broad spectrum? <laughs> No, I think that, I think that, I mean, I can't remember all the specific criticisms, but I think that those books, and I mean, it's the same. I, I, I think that the anti-vaccine movement adds to the discourse. The problem is that the internet, uh, which we currently use as our sort of determinant on what's important, is entirely driven by popularity, right? So it's, uh, if 500,000 people view a particular video, well, that's at the top of your browser when you put in the vaccine, right? So that's one of the problems is I do think that these sorts of books, and, and in fact, those criticisms that Ben Gold, a lot of them directed at pharma, have come through already. They are in the scientific uh, discussion, and they have fed into things like the Sunshine Act, things like um, the sort of uh, clinical trials registry. Those responses are driven to some extent by those criticisms. So I don't think that you know, uh, he, he was entirely offline, but again, often with single authors, you know, people put through hypotheses that they need to be tested and makes criticisms. And it, it's, it, to me, it's part of the discourse, and some of them were valid, but it's not, you know, you have to consider a broader picture. And if you're trying to make individual decisions, consult a wider source. And I think that that still stands in that toolkit. Avoid the lone voice, you know? True, and I mean, I also think that uh, I didn't put the slide up, but uh, I, I, I've sort of skipped over it for time. But there's um, our tolerance for uncertainty has also declined in modern society, and I think, in fact, the epidemiologist I heard in Oxford, Richard Petter, who was uh, a student of Richard Dahl, and he showed a fantastic graph, which was a very simple graph of life expectancy and infant mortality in 1900 compared to 2010, uh, and what he was saying is that. In 1900, uh, parents had infant mortality was close to 25, 20%. You had a one in, one in five chance of having a child die before the age of five. And that compared to now, which is almost like 0.1 or, or even less than that. Uh, and because of that, there's this sort of, I mean, if you look, uh, pregnancy is another area which is just full of, of, of things you must do, mustn't do, you know, all those things. And I think it's because we have this ability now to control our environment so brilliantly in so many ways, and that our tolerance for uncertainty in the sort of process of, of health and science has gone away, you know? That together with the fact that Google is, you know, so successful. I'll put up this, uh, I wonder if I can find it. Uh, this picture I liked as well, I'll show you. There. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. No problem. No problem.